meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in Christ, consider the epiphany of our Lord Jesus Christ. For epiphany means to be revealed. And so throughout the epiphany season, Christ is revealed a little bit at a time, beginning with the visitation of the Magi. And you see how Christ reveals himself in ways that don't quite seem to make sense to us. I mean, the visitation of the Magi was certainly great and wonderful. But how many people at the time actually knew what happened? No doubt Herod would have tried to keep this quiet. He didn't want people to know that the king of the Jews had been born of Bethlehem of Judea after all. He went so far as to try to, trying to keep it quiet that he had all of the sons, two years and younger, killed. So that he would keep this message quiet. And think then about the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ. Certainly there were people gathered around the Jordan River when Christ was baptized by John. There were people who heard the voice of God saying, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. People saw the Holy Spirit descend upon our Lord Jesus Christ in the form of a dove. But it wasn't the whole world. I mean, this probably didn't even make much of a blip on the local news and today we come to another event that seems great until you think about it more. How many people get married? Hundreds of people get married. Thousands of people get married. It's not that big of a thing. And Jesus goes to the wedding. We don't know if he goes as an honored guest or just because he's related to his mother Mary, of course. And his disciples come along as friends. They're his plus twelve. <laughs> and yet... At this wedding feast in Cana in Galilee, Christ manifests himself. He reveals himself. But you see how he reveals himself in such a small way. I mean, do, do the husband and wife even know what's happened? It doesn't even seem like the master of ceremonies really knows what's happening. There's just some new wine. And it's better than the old wine. Where did it come from? The disciples certainly knew, the servants certainly knew, but we're not given in Scripture the evidence that anyone else knows what's happened here. And yet, this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and the disciples believed in him. You notice, just the disciples believed in him. Not even everyone at the wedding feast knew what happened or believed in him. Not everyone at the wedding feast saw his glory. This is part of the mystery of our holy Christian faith, that God comes to us in seemingly mundane and ordinary ways. He comes to us in the day-to-day -day of our lives. A child is born. Well, this happens all the time. And yet, a child is born, and God visits his people. A child is born, and we can say, Emmanuel, God is with us child is born and given the name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And yet this child is born and a few shepherds know about it. This child is born and some wise men come from the east, but other than that, there doesn't seem to be any world-shaking changes. A man is baptized in the Jordan River. Well, people were flocking to John to be baptized for the repentance of sins. A man is baptized in the Jordan River, a little bit of water, as I said last week, you remember? That water is nothing spectacular. It's filthy and dirty like the water from any river you would find. And yet you are baptized with a little bit of water. God manifests his glory, and you believe in him. And today, the wedding feast at Cana, it's not a huge thing. And yet, Christ reveals his glory in this. In our epistle reading, which no doubt makes us squirm in our modern sensibilities, we see how Christ reveals himself even in the most common of relationships, the relationship of a man and a what? And a woman. Husband and wife. God reveals himself to us in this relationship as well. For the wife stands as the church, and the husband stands as Christ, and Christ loves his bride, the church, and the husband is to love his wife even as Christ loves his bride, the church, and to give his life up for his wife. 
even as Christ gave his life up for Christ, for his church. And so in our daily interactions, you see, we have these constant reminders that God is here present for us. That God has utterly and completely invaded our lives, manifesting his glory. Every sip of water you take, you can remember your baptism. The fact that God sustains you when you wash your face in the morning, Luther says, remember that you are baptized. When you gather at wedding feasts, wedding celebrations, you remember that Christ first came to manifest his glory at a wedding. What a beautiful thing. <coughs> Husband and wife coming together to make one flesh. It is a mystery, and it is a mystery that points us to the greater mystery. It is a feast, but it is a feast that points us to the greater feast. But... Man in his sinfulness is always wanting something more. And we see this with Moses, don't we? Think for a moment of all the ways in which Moses beheld the glory of God. I mean, from that first plague, turning the waters of Egypt into blood, through the last plague, the death of all the firstborn, Moses beheld God's glory. And the world at that time, Egypt being the greatest power in the world, beheld God's glory. But did all of the Egyptians convert and believe? Even Moses, we see, after so long Moses has been following God, a servant of God, Moses still says, you must show me something greater. I want to see your glory, God. As if a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night were not enough. As if separating the waters of the Red Sea that Moses and the people of Israel would walk across it on dry ground was not enough. As if bringing water from the rock was not enough. Providing manna in the wilderness and quail to eat in the wilderness were not enough. Moses says, I want to see your glory. And we also desire Something more from God than what he has given. We want to see his glory. Do you know that there are Christians today who find little objects and they ascribe it to God's glory? They think it's miraculous. There are Christians today who, without any kind of irony or joking around, will say, I was praying, and when I looked up from praying, a single feather dropped in front of me. And the Holy Spirit visited me. I wish they were making this up. You all know I have a bird. She's molting now, which means she's replacing all of her feathers. The Holy Spirit is all over our house if that's the measure by which we judge God's glory. People will go walking around, they'll look on the ground and, oh, there's a penny here, a penny from heaven. Have you ever heard that? People look for God's glory every place other than where it is. Or perhaps they see a cardinal. Oh, it's cardinal. It's not just cold and attractive to my house because there's food here. It's the soul of my loved one. People want to see God's glory apart from where he has promised it will be. People want to see God's glory in ways that satisfy their own desires. And when I say people, hear me clearly. It's not just people outside here. It's not just people who aren't gathered today. It's people, including standing behind the pulpit, people sitting in their pews, who desire something more from God than he has promised. But think for a moment, beloved in Christ, what has God promised you? He has promised to be present where his word is. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. You have heard that word. It has been sent out today. And the Holy Spirit has called, gathered, and enlightened you here in this place. That you may hear this word. That you may have this word placed upon your lips. That it may go into your ear. That you may taste and see the goodness of the Lord. You have this clear, eternal, unchanging word of God here. And it is sent out to you that you may be delivered from your destruction. That you may be healed. And you want something. You walk past this font every Sunday. Perhaps you were not baptized at this particular font, but you were baptized. 
get something humble and unassuming. And you want something more. You come to this, his holy altar. And what is it that it gives you here? If it were just a little piece of so-called bread, not this little styrofoam piece that I seem to give you, if it were just that, a little taste of unleavened bread, a little sip of wine, well, we would be pitied amongst all people if we'd find a hope in these things alone. But with the clear and unchanging <laughs> eternal word of God, with his promise, by his command, this bread and wine is no mere bread and wine. It is his true body and blood, once sacrificed on the altar of Calvary, now given to you, placed into your lips. Do you want something more? I know that they are mundane things. They happen every Sunday. I know that water is around us everywhere. We're made up of water mostly. I know that a little bit of bread and a little bit of wine isn't spectacular. And yet, God comes to you in these normal mundane things to give you life and salvation, the forgiveness of sins. God comes to you in your day-to-day -day relationships, husband and wife. God comes to you <laughs> in this relationship, parents to their children, children to their parents. Brothers and sisters united beneath the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. God comes to you in these everyday things. Why is this? Moses, wanting to see God's glory, wanted something that would have killed him. For what does God say to him when he says, Lord, I know. Essentially, think about what Moses is saying. Essentially, he says, God, you've done all these other things, but it's not enough. Give me what I want. And what does God say to him? But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. God is saying to Moses, what you want will kill you, so I'm not going to do that to you. And yet we have beheld God's face, and how is it that we behold God's face? It's because we have been united with Christ in a death like his. You see what he's done? He's already put us to death and raised us to new life that we may behold his glory in the simple, everyday things that we may behold his glory as he has promised to reveal it to us, as he has promised to give it to us. God has done this. What a blessed thing it is. I want you to think about this the next time you want something more, the next time you desire some other sign from God, or you think, oh, the church is just so blah, it's so boring, it's the same stuff every week. You think about what it is that Christ truly gives you here in this church. How he reveals himself to you. How he has manifested his glory to you. And you turn from your own self-centered, <laughs> sinful ways. And you turn again to Christ as he comes to us here at this altar. As he comes to us with his word that he has sent out to heal you. His word that he has sent out to deliver you from destruction. And you will shout for joy to God with all the earth. You will sing the glory of his name. You will give him glorious praise. When you stop for a moment and consider his loving kindness and mercy to you. How he comes to you. Simply. <coughs> how he comes to you in ways that you cannot escape. In ways that utterly surround you. And this is the love of God. It utterly surrounds you. And fills you with all good things. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.